In this section, I want to introduce you to the concept of adiabatic flow and compression. What exactly is adiabatic? So here I want to describe to you something known as a Joule-Thomson effect. Now, an adiabatic process is one in which that no heat is added or removed from a system. Consider this poor representation of a valve, and this over here is its system boundaries. This is a valve whereby the amount of materials going in is equivalent to the amount of materials going out. And in an adiabatic process, no heat is added or removed from this system. So, using the valve as the system and assuming that the valve is insulated, hence adiabatic, there is no heat flow. And in a steady state flow, the first law essentially is described as this, if you recall. So because there is no heat flow, it's adiabatic. Hence, dq is equals to zero. The boundary does not move. Nothing moves, in fact. Hence, dw is equals to zero. All right. And for a steady state, the mass into the system is equal to the mass leaving to the system. Hence, we can cancel mass in and mass out. Hence, we can rewrite the equation as enthalpy of the input is equals to the enthalpy of the output. We describe this as an isenthalpic process, where the enthalpy going in is the same as the enthalpy going out. Okay, here in this slide, I really want to talk a little bit about what exactly is an equation of state. Now, determining the variation of enthalpy or internal energy with pressure relies on understanding the relationships between the different physical variables that describe the condition of a material. Okay, so that really is an equation of state. Let's see if we can understand a little that bit better. So let's consider, say, a, an ideal gas. All right, this over here is an ideal gas equation. Okay, PV is equals to nRT. P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles, T is temperature, R is the ideal gas constant. Doesn't change. So remember we said in the previous section of the lecture that we are going to be able to figure out exactly what one thermodynamic variable was if we were able to measure two other thermodynamic variables if we knew the number of moles within the system. In this case, we do know the number of moles in the system, and we can try to figure out exactly what the pressure is just by measuring temperature and volume. So let's try to simplify everything and bring everything to the right-hand side, leaving pressure on the right-hand side. We can do that first by dividing both sides by the number of moles, and that will give us specific volume over here. Okay, and after which you can manipulate the equation further by bringing specific volume below RT. Hence, if we were able to get a value for T and volume, temperature and volume, multiply it by the ideal gas constant, we will be able to figure out what exactly is the pressure of the ideal gas. And that's really what an equation of state is, something that describes the condition of a material. So here I really wanted to touch upon what exactly is an ideal gas. An ideal gas really is just a gas with continuity. What that really means is that it doesn't undergo any kind of phase change, either with a change in pressure, volume, or temperature. In real life, when you subject a gas to a change in temperature, volume, or temperature, it tends to undergo some kind of a phase change. It crystallizes, it becomes liquid, it just doesn't remain a gas anymore. So ideal gases don't really exist in real life. However, for the sake of our thermodynamic calculations, we will use equations and assume that all gases are ideal. So there are a number of things that we want to try and remember about ideal gases. Firstly, at a constant temperature, internal energy does not change. Similarly, enthalpy does not change. Now, remember we talked about R a moment ago, which was the ideal gas constant. 
R is always going to be CP minus CV. CP will always be larger than CV. Why? Because in an open system, an ideal gas, so long as you apply some kind of heat to it, even if it's just sitting there, okay, it tends to do work on its own, and hence the internal energy of CP will always be larger than that of a closed system. Hence, CP minus CV is the ideal gas constant. These values over here describe the CV and CP for monoatomic ideal gases and diatomic ideal gases. A monoatomic ideal gas literally is just a gas that's made of a single atom. A diatomic ideal gas is a gas which is made out of two atoms. All right, and each of them have a slightly different CV and CP. These things have already been worked out. You don't really have to memorize them. However, most of them will probably be given to you during the exam if you are asked a question like this. And um, you can also find these things in lots of reference books. Okay, we've talked about adiabatic expansion. We've also talked a little bit about ideal gas. How about the adiabatic expansion and compression of an ideal gas? Let's consider a system like this. It's a closed system. Okay, system T. All right. And it has a volume of a gas at a given temperature and pressure. It is adiabatic. Hence, no heat is absorbed or given out. So first, let's write the equation for the first law down. All right, dQ plus dW is equals to dU. And because it's adiabatic, Hence, no heat is absorbed or given out. We can cancel this term. There is no change in heat. So dW is equal to dU in adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas. All right. Now, we've got to turn this term into something where we can express pressure. So we can rewrite the dW as negative PdV. And we can also rewrite dU as NCV dt. Why? Because remember the equation for Cv is ncv is equals to du over dt keeping volume constant. Okay and based on this we can hence equate this to this in an expression like that. So if you bear with me for a little bit Let's try to work this out, the adiabatic expansion and compression of an ideal gas. Starting with the ideal gas equation, we can differentiate it to give us PdV plus VdP equals to nRdt. Why do we differentiate this? Because we need an expression for work, which is negative PdV. Okay, so this over here is an expression for work. Okay, rearranging this to this, we'll get negative PdV is equals to negative RdT plus VdP equals to NCVdT. Remember a moment ago, what was NCVdT? This was du. All right. So if we were to take this entire equation over here, we can simplify it further to give us VdP equals to NCV plus RdT. We know that Cp minus Cv is equal to R, and this can be rewritten as Cp is equal to R plus Cv, and hence this can be substituted in there to form Vdp is equal to NCpdt. So taking the ideal gas equation one more time, we know that V is equal to nRt, over P, and this can be substituted in here to give us eventually nRt over P dP equals to ncp dt. And this eventually simplifies to this expression over here. So we assume that Cp is constant during the entire process. And if we integrate both sides, eventually we will decompose both sides into these expressions over here. 
Now, I'm not going to go through this lengthy bit of gymnastics over here. It's available in your notes. However, the most important part is to know that these two expressions eventually will decompose into these three constants. So the most important takeaway essentially about adiabatic expansion and compression of an ideal gas is the relationship between temperature and pressure. I'm now referring to this constant over here. Assume that we rewrite this again in a fractionated form. P is R over Cp. Any increase in temperature will lead to an increase in pressure. Conversely, any decrease in pressure will lead to a decrease in temperature. All right, and know that this actually is a constant, which means that it does not change. So how does this really relate to you in real life? If you've ever had one of those aerosols cans, okay, one of these things over here, and you actually depressed one of these cans, notice one thing, okay, that the temperature of the aerosol can goes down as the pressure goes down. That means as more of the gas is liberated from the aerosol can, you feel the can getting colder and colder. And that really is an illustration of adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas out through a nozzle over here. Okay, so that might have been a little bit complex. However, let's try to understand that using an example. In this particular example, gaseous helium is used to rapidly cool a hot sample. The helium is stored in an insulated 50 litre tank at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius at a pressure of 20 atmospheres. What is the temperature of the first helium gas to hit the sample? Let's first look at a couple of key words. Here, we know that the tank is insulated. What does that mean? It means that we're looking at an adiabatic process. We want to find out the temperature of the first helium gas. That also means that the airflow is very rapid. So let's try and illustrate a little bit. This is the 50 litre tank. The first thing we need to do is to define our system. In this case, our system is the valve, just before the nozzle, whereby the helium gas exits the tank. Here in the valve, we know it's an open system. Why? Because helium gas enters, and helium gas exits. So it is an open system. And we hence can use the first law equation for an open system here. We know that the mass of the helium entering is exactly the same as the mass exiting. So input is equal to output. We can cancel those off. This essentially decomposes to delta H plus Q plus DQ plus DW. The system is not doing any work. It's essentially a static system, just allowing stuff to go in and out. Hence, DW is equal to zero. We've also established that it's an adiabatic process. Hence, there is no change in heat. Therefore, delta H is equal to zero. We can rewrite this as H input, okay, minus H output is equals to zero. We can also rewrite this as H input is equals to H output. What does this mean? It means that the process is isenthalpic. And since enthalpy is a function of temperature and pressure. That means the temperature has not changed. And the temperature of the gas first exiting the tank is exactly the same as when it was first going through the nozzle at 25 degrees Celsius. So let's explore an extension to that problem. As the helium flows, what will be the temperature of the helium entering the quench chamber when the pressure in the tank has fallen to 10 atmospheres. If we remember correctly, we started with an initial pressure of 20 atmospheres. As helium exits the tank, the pressure in the tank drops to 
10 atmospheres. And we want to know how that has affected the temperature. To solve this problem, we can use the formula for the isentropic process of a natural gas. Since we are looking for the final temperature, we can simplify the equation as this. From here on out, it's just about plugging in the values. For a monoatomic ideal gas like helium, gamma is typically around 5 over 3. And the initial temperature, T1, is 298 Kelvin, which is about 25 degrees Celsius. Plugging in the numbers and solving for the equation, we know that the final temperature is around 226 Kelvin or negative 47.15 degrees Celsius.